All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, please join me in welcoming our final speaker of the year, Carrie Fountain. He is a part of our Martha Allen Lecture Series, which brings in artists throughout the year to talk about their work. For those of you who have attended the last several artist talks, you may have noticed that Carrie was mentioned by both Anne Tronson, our foundation's show juror, and by Sarah Garden Armstrong, whose work is currently on display in the pool gallery. So art world is a small world, it turns out. Um, <clears throat> Carrie graduated from the University of Alabama in 2014. He is the manager of public programs at the Birmingham Museum of Art. And he has recently been recognized by South Arts as an emerging leader of color in their professional development program. He also received a grant from the Southern Artists for Social, Social Change for his Black Cherry Tree project, which I'm gonna let him tell you more about. And um, one thing that I am really jealous of is that he also interviewed the artist Amy Sherald, who you probably know from painting the Michelle Obama's portrait for the National Portrait Gallery uh, last November as part of the Birmingham Museum of Arts Chenoweth Lecture. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Misty, for that great introduction. Um, thank you all for taking your time to hear me speak today. Um, it is great to see everyone's pictures or cameras on or your names, whatever you're comfortable with. I just appreciate you being here. Um, and yeah, as, as Misty so graciously said, I mean, um, I, I guess I'm an artist. I guess I would be what you consider an artist. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about how I got to what I'm doing today. Um, but I really wanna make this a discussion. So if you have any questions or anything, please go ahead and um, leave them in the chat as we go along. And then at the end, that way um, we can have a list of questions and I can go over everyone's questions and you don't forget questions that may be on your mind. So just wanna be um, of value to y'all today. And I wanna make sure I answer everyone's questions. Um, so just feel free to share with me as I share with you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and can everyone see my screen? Is it good? All right. So uh, who am I? Um, you know, of course I mentioned earlier, I'm an artist, a uh, multidisciplinary artist. I kind of, I feel like I stumbled into this role um, unknowingly. Um, but deeper than who I am, you know, as far as like how I would define myself based on society, you know, I think it's, I, I asked this question because this question isn't really for me, it's more so about us. Who am I? Like, how do we define I? Um, and, you know, I'm always, I think this is something that's always interesting to think about because we all have different definitions of who I am or who you are, um, but ultimately there's, there's, there's I, there's one word that describes that and it's I. So, um, so I am awareness witnessing an ever-changing flow of experiences called life. And this quote is pulled from one of my favorite books. Uh, it's called The Mystery Experience by Tim Freak. Um, and it's a, it's a spirit, a good spiritual philosophical read, if that's your thing, but, um, he defined I in that book and it, and it really stuck with me after reading that. And, um, I, and I think this is so important because at the core, we are aware and we witness life and we experience things in our life that we try to define, um, based on our awareness. So if you know that I am awareness, um, then if you can really just focus on that awareness, then it can really change, you know, the, the flow and experience, oh, experience. You know, on your life. At least that's how I look at it. And so are you. Um, so 
I put this quote in here, you know, I was, as I was preparing this, these slides, I really, it really got me just thinking about different lessons and things that I've learned and things that I just hope I can share that may be of uh, value to y'all. So um, don't ever forget that we are far more alike than different, yet taught to define ourselves from our differences. So, you know, this is, um, this has always kind of motivated me and I, and I think it's what's gotten me involved in the arts. Um, you know, I think we can spend all day trying to figure out our differences, but at the core, if you have a conversation with somebody, nine times out of 10, there's so many, so much more that you have a like with that person um, than different. And, I, and I, I just think it's just simply about looking for those and searching for those. So that's kind of motivated me. So moving forward, we get into my beginnings. So um, I've, this is a picture of me and, and my friend Cody Boynton in high school. Um, it all started with me for music. Um, that was always just important to me. Music was big in my family. Um, my mother and father were just heavy into all kinds of music and I would always wake up in the morning to music blasting um, all kind of oldies and hip hop and all, all just all kind of genres. So growing up, that was always my dream. And, um, you know, so this is a picture of me and Cody Boynton in high school. We used to play at uh, talent shows and we used to play at coffee houses. We thought we were the coolest people ever. Um, and you couldn't tell us anything, sadly. So, um, you know, this was a project that I had finally put out in high school, which was called A Different Thing. Um, so I, I had liked music for a while, and, but I was always shy about it. And finally, this meant a lot to me because it was the first time where I built up the courage to put something out. Um, and I think I put this out around like, 10th, 11th grade. Um, and yeah, it was just me being vulnerable and just me just taking that leap of faith with knowing, all right, I want to do music. How do I do it? So, and then of course it kind of all spread out from there. These are different pictures from like old projects and stuff. As you can see, I went through a range of personalities and definitely thought I was a rock star. This is, uh, you know, my buddy, still to this day, um, Josh McTeer, aka Kudos, he is really heavy into the music scene. Um, and, you know, in, in doing music, one thing that I really learned and realized was that two heads are always better than one. Learning to collaborate is what it's all about. Um, and, you know, music is such a collaborative effort and I mean, I think all art is in general. I just think that um, it's so important to learn to build those working relationships with people and, um, and understand that no idea is perfect and it can always be added to. So, you know, being involved, you know, knowing I love music and I just had this passion, um, I didn't really have any structure to my creative life. It was just kind of a chaotic blend of passion. So this right here is a picture of me at the University of Alabama. I was in Creative Campus, which was a uh, student intern program where we basically worked to um, work in the University of Alabama to come up with different ideas to, you know, help to just bring, bring fun and spark imagination amongst the campus community. And that kind of helped me to just get a glimpse into what a professional career in the arts could look like. Of course, still doing music. This is uh, another shot I thought was kind of funny going back on. Um, so, you know, for me with, with music, uh, I, again, like I started off in music and it was never even occurred to me of being an artist um, or like a, in, to visual art. So 
I kind of, you know, th th this is another lesson I learned around that time, which is learning to have a vision that extends your medium. Your medium is only a tool to channel your spirit. Um, you know, and growing up for me too, with music, I was, I was kind of, I feel like a lot of creatives are told this, you have to pick something and stick with it. And um, I do not believe that at all. I think that you are, you are supposed to try as many things as possible because all they are are tools. So why not learn as many tools as you can and eventually they'll start to blend together. So going from that and taking that into consideration, um, me and some buddies in school started Live Grind Love, which was, um, started off as a clothing line. It still is a clothing line somewhat. Um, and we, it started with this vision of, you know, unity um, and, but still making cool, I guess, like streetwear attire. So this is my buddy, John Morgan Davenport, who's one of the founders and my buddy, Tyler Burns. Um, and it kind of just came out of conversations we all had. I mean, John Morgan, he's clear, he's white, I was black and Tyler was mixed. And we used to get into these really deep conversations about um, just people embracing their similarities and opposed to their differences. So we decided to do a clothing line and that was how LGL started. Um, and then events kind of came out of that because we, we were like, oh, well, we need to start doing events to get people to know about the clothing line. And we knew we, we wanted to transition into being more of a charitable clothing line. So these are some early, really, really cringy flyers that we made. And yeah, so, and through that whole process, I mean, the long story short, the clothing line did not skyrocket and blow up like we wished it, it would. We made tons of mistakes, but through that, I learned to learn and committing to your curiosity, um, which was a win for me because I would have never done anything except for music. So getting into clothing kind of just opened up new doors to where I started to get into doing digital art. Um, and I guess a little bit of background before that, uh, while I was in college, I got a job working for the Sanford Media Center at the University of Alabama. Um, I used to go in there every day and make beats because they had a free studio. So I would go in there every day and I would just make beats and I would try to get a job there and I did not get the job there for the first year, but I just kept going. And then eventually they offered me a job there. So in doing that, I learned to work a lot of different software. Um, I learned Photoshop, I learned Final Cut Pro video editing, um, you know, we, I, learning like music recording software. Um, so I really got started to kind of get ideas about digital art and it, it started to kind of open up doors in that way. So this was the first piece of digital art that I had made. And this one is called Trayvon. I actually made it. It was uh, around the time uh, when Trayvon Martin was killed. And if you can see right here, this is supposed to be, this hooded character is supposed to be Trayvon. And, um, all these different pieces coming together represent society. Um, that's why you see the different shades of this face. And there's this battle between good and evil right here. So it was, you know, it kind of, it started off as just doodling. And I was like, you know what, why not try to make it digital? And why not try to believe in myself on this? So, um, working through LGL and, and doing clothing line and then starting to get more involved into art. Uh, I, I came up and I don't wanna say I came up with it cause it really was through different conversations and various other people. Um, but Do Re Mi was developed and um, that was basically a way to, the, the thinking behind it was, uh, I wanted to take what we had tried to do with LGL, but not make it so clothing focused. I wanted to make a platform 
um, for people to debate and talk about differences and, and get rewarded and incentivized for sharing their opinions. And that was, that was what it, it was. So I, these are different pictures of posts that I would do. Um, you know, we, we had an Instagram, we still, there still is an Instagram account for it. I'm just not active on it, but um, I would post different posts on the Instagram account and try to drive people to the website. And they were all different questions. And the, the way the site worked was um, it incentivized people. I, I, I went in, I hired a coder to code this website. And um, basically you'd sign up, you find something that interests you and you will earn do re mi dollars for sharing your, your POV. And then as you save up on those do re mi dollars, you can actually buy artwork from other artists. You can buy shoes, clothing, um, I just tried to put interesting items in there that I thought people may be interested in to use the platform. Um, so in doing that, it was very hard to communicate this with people. This was another one. It was an idea I thought was amazing, a billion dollar idea, but it wasn't taken off. So I was like, you know what? I have to start doing events. I have to start doing, I have to start getting this, the word out here. And really from doing this, I began to, Do Re Mi really started to build a community of artists um, because what I was doing was I was, I was allowing artists to, uh, I was sharing their work on the platform and then I was asking them if they wanna sell their work on the platform. So I was really making a big community of artists and I was like, you know what? Gotta start doing events and really try to give a platform to these artists because the website ain't doing what I thought it was gonna do. So. Um, that was how Lit House kind of came about. So when I first moved to Birmingham, um, so I, you know, I'm originally, I grew up in Northern Virginia, DC metropolitan area, and I went to University of Alabama, I went back home and I moved back to Birmingham in about 2015 or so. Um, and you know, it was, my buddy John Morgan from LGO, who was like, yeah, there's a good music scene here. You should come down here. And he was really connected in the music scene. So I was like, all right, cool. And uh, started doing events. Lit House was one of them. And it was basically um, people could perform. So artists could perform. And then artists would showcase their, like visual artists would showcase their work. And it became a pretty... Um, we, we did a lot of them for over the span of two years. It just became a, a consecutive thing that we, we kept doing pretty consistently. Um, through that, I started to keep getting more confident in doing visual art and kind of not being so dependent on music. So this picture here is actually, I think it's like my first ever art show. As you can see, it was just prints that I had going with the digital, you know, me, me designing digital art and, um, you know, even though these are very, these are five very small, cheaply produced prints, this really meant a lot to me at the time, just to, just to do this. And um, from there, you know, things started to bubble again. And this is the beginning of Vibes and Virtues, which I'll get to later, but I had noticed you know, okay, with the events we're doing with Lit House, they're cool and all that, but it's not really, helping to educate people about the do re mi platform because I still had the website and I, and I still was not ha having people engage with it like I wanted to. So I was like, all right, I need to do more events that are not so music centered and not performance based, but get people talking and incentivizes them to engage in conversation. And then that way they go home and they're signed up on the website and they'd be the biggest fan of the website and stay on it forever. Of course they didn't, but you know, the events that came from that created vibes and virtues, which I'll get to later. So, you know, these are some other pictures of my artwork, you know, just feeling more confident and experimenting with different mediums and just being around other creatives to inspire, um, just kind of created different ideas and stuff. So while this is all going on, um, I was serving tables at Bonefish Grill. And, um, you know, one thing I think 
when you're pursuing, especially a career in something like the arts, you know, if you're like me, I mean, hopefully you do better than me, but you don't make money in this stuff. <laughs> like, if anything, you lose, you, you spend money in it. So, and that can happen for years, but you should not lose faith. So you need a job to support yourself. And the good thing about working in the restaurant industry is that you kind of have the flexibility and freedom to, with your schedule, to be able to, you know, if you have an event or something you're organizing or you have an art show, you have a flexibility with that job that you wouldn't have with the very strict scheduling job. And then you learn to talk to people, you learn to network. Um, you also, you know, I think you learn a lot about controlling your energy too, because, you know, when you're trying to get a tip off a table, if you come in there feeling negative, then they're going to feel it too. And it's going to affect your pay. So that was what I was doing. I was serving tables. And in the meantime, was trying to get all these different ideas off the ground that weren't making me any money, but it felt good. And um, yeah, so, you know, around that time, what happened is I had a traumatic injury. I, I, um, I fell and I broke my back. Um, and because of that, I could not be on my feet like I could typically working at the restaurant. So I had to start to think of options. So, you know, here you see a picture with two of my coworkers at the restaurant visiting me in the hospital. And this is me disobeying my doctor's orders, um, fresh off the hospital with a back brace on choosing to perform. Um, and, you know. So I had to figure something out. I was, you know, I was like, all right, well, I need to make money. Um, at this point too, I had, a, I had my son on the way. I have a four-year-old son. So I had to figure something out. And, you know, somebody had contacted me about a job opening at Space 111. I thought I would be interested in. The job was for educational coordinator. I applied for the job. I interviewed for the job. And I was not qualified one bit to get an education coordinator position. But thank God they liked me for some reason and they offered me an administrative associate position at Space 111. Um, and Space 111 is a small nonprofit. So you're not making lots of money at all. So I still had to work at the restaurant um, while doing this job. And it was, it was a really demanding job in terms of my schedule and what I was used to at the restaurant because I was working from yeah. nine to five. So Space 111 um, really helped me to get an understanding of, I guess, how um, the arts field worked in terms of just nonprofits and funding and um, working with artists. So very helpful but also this was a challenging time because I was juggling a lot. My son was born. This is a picture of my son, Kaysen. Um, so he was born around this time. So I'm still working at the restaurant. I, I think actually I had three jobs at this point in time with a broken back still. I wasn't even supposed to be working, but I knew I had a baby on the way. So I had to try to make some money. And um, I learned in this process to embrace the hard work because it's molding you. And that's why it's so hard. Um, so keeping that at the forefront, it, it just kind of inspired me to, okay, don't panic, don't stress out. The reason why this is hard is because it's making you who you need to be in order to do the things that you wanna do. So Vibes and Virtues um, kind of came out you know, like I said earlier, with wanting to figure out how to explain Do Re Mi and get this platform working. Um, and I realized the feedback from Vibes and Virtues was really positive. And I just saw how people were responding, the kind of conversations it was creating, um, the demographics that were coming to this. It was exactly what I wanted, which was to remind people of their similarities instead of their differences. And there, it was just a really diverse crowd and I was just really proud of that. So I just continued to explore that and without knowing it, you know, was creating an interactive art experience. So here's some early pictures from it. 
it started, the, you know, um, artists would come and show. I would find local artists that I had been meeting and I would just give them an opportunity to show in um, a gallery space. Um, and, you know, then there was, there was a convert in this picture, you see more of, uh, more, of course, this is all before COVID. So that's why nobody has a face mask on. But um, everyone's talking, it's, it's, it's a puzzle game that people are playing and you have to figure out where your puzzle piece goes on a grid. Um, and the only way to figure that out is from talking to people about your question. So um, it was an interesting concept that's, that, I mean, still to this day, I'm still doing vibes and virtues. Um, and, you know, again, like it, it was something that was just blending so many disciplines of art and I would have never been able to do something like this if I had listened to the people say you need to choose one thing to focus on um, so here's some other pictures and again there's another quote that came to mind when doing this treat your artistic process like a superpower use it to find solutions and um, just to speak on that you know I, I believe as artists that we have a responsibility to tell our truth. Um, and we sometimes don't realize how we impact people. And it is a superpower in terms of you can really change, you can create a piece of art that changes someone's perspective and you would never even know it. That person can go in with a certain set of ideas and leave with a completely new set just off of looking at your picture and being inspired by it. So, you know, value your process and realize that it is your superpower and, you know, always use it to find solutions because the, the, the pro if you're like me, at least my artistic process starts with the problem. So, you know, just something that may be of value to y'all. Um, so again, during this time, um, I'm still serving tables. I'm working at Space 111. I'm trying to get all this stuff going. Um, so I'm doing little pop-up events. Here's some different designs you see from by, or, uh, Live, Grind, Love. Me doing sign-up sheets. And um, this picture is very important. So this is the moment that things started to change. This is the exact moment. And it is because of that guy right there, <laughs> Moses Presnell. So um, I met Moses at this exact moment. And it was funny because when I, I didn't see, know this picture existed, so I was going back trying to find old pictures. But um, Moses is a local artist. Um, he is a painter, muralist. And you know I was at this flea market not selling anything. Nobody's really interested. I'm getting in a few little small talk conversations, hoping people support my work. And he comes up and it thinks that one of the shirts that I have is the best thing ever. And he's, you can see his face. He thinks it's amazing and he wants to get it. And I just think that it's kind of weird actually. I'm like, uh, are you sure? And then it's even weirder because he didn't have any cash on hand and he was gonna, he walked two miles to go to an ATM to come back and buy the shirt, which I thought was uh, really one of a kind. So um, in that time, Mo, it came, me and Moses started to uh, become cool and he was looking for a studio space to, to, to paint because his space, he didn't have a space anymore. And just coincidentally, I had an extra room in my apartment um, that I wasn't using. And I was, you know, in need of I was at a point in my life where I was in solitude and it was held, it was needed that I had at least some friend or some, somebody there to kind of like not make me go off the deep end. And um, so Moses uh, rented it out as a studio and he would come by and paint. And, um, you know, from this, from that picture I showed you and from hopefully the rest of this presentation, you can see that one thing always leads to another and we don't realize it in the moment, but in retrospect, you always see the, where the dots connected. So 
Um, so, you know, here's some more pictures of Moses. Um, he, the one on the left is a mural that he painted on First Avenue North. Um, and then the one on the right is a mural that he's actually painting right now at Tropicaleo. Um, so, you know, Moses, I, I would see him paint and it intrigued me. And I was like, man, I really want to learn how to paint. And he just told me, just go and do it. So these, uh, I finally was like, all right, whatever that means. So I just went and got some canvases and just started painting and he just let me use his supplies. And these were some early paintings of mine. Um, I was really obsessed with this idea of having an image um, where it turns, where depending on how you, on how you turn it, it looks like a different image. Um, and that was a lot of my early work, what it was about. So here you see some early paintings. Um, here right here is a mural, first, first mural that uh, me and Moses had did together. Um, and yeah, it again, just kind of got me into that space and the thinking about murals and more public art projects. And um, this is something else I've thought about. You know, I think as I think as artists too, we uh, there's this tendency to be very go with the flow and um, you know wait for the inspiration to strike you. But what I've kind of learned that um, really to be I guess successful in the business side of this, all the business owners, anyone who's booking you for some kind of commission. The only difference is that they require you to meet some kind of deadline. So, you know, I, I thought about that and I just wanted to include that in here as I think, you know, a big part of success is simply just taking deadlines seriously and treating your, your, um, treating your art like a job and like a business. So these are some me, some later, my work is, is getting a little bit more, I'm getting a little bit more confident in trying new things. And, you know, I'm, I'm really starting to love where it's all going. Um, these are some early murals when I first started to take the leap of faith myself um, away from Moses's training wheels. And, you know, these are, some more more recent murals that I've done. And another quote, um, art is an ongoing conversation that anyone can add to. Contribute something valuable that is true to you. If it abides to these rules and makes you nervous, then you know it is what you're supposed to do. So if it makes you fearful, if it makes you nervous, do it, do it. Um, some more pictures of my work. This is, I, in, in this slide, I was really just trying to show uh, the multidisciplinary um, aspect of where I was going. You know, you can see some paintings in there, some more uh, sculptural kind of works. Um, you see some digital art and then you see some photography projects that I was working on. And during this time too, I mean, I was still, still doing music and um, I was trying to find its place, you know, and um, I was I was still dividing music as a separate, seeing it as separate from my arts, which I, I was beginning to realize was hindering me. And, um, you know, this is a quote that I, I had realized and I use this in my artist statements a lot, but Music helps one let go of reality while art helps piece it together. I'm interested in the language in the middle. So um, transitioning again, I'm still working at uh, Space 111. Well, no, 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 I take that back. I worked at Space 111 for a year and a half and but I'm still serving tables because after I stopped working with Space 111, I really had to make the bills keep getting paid. So I had to pick up extra shifts at the restaurant. By that time, my son was in this world and I had to make it happen. Um, so this right here is Arts Revive in Selma. Um, 
I had started working with them and it kind of took some pressure off me having to work as much as the re at the restaurant. Um, I got a part-time intern, intern position, a programming director intern position here. Um, they're in Selma, which if you know where Selma's at, it is uh, about an hour and a half, two hours away of Birmingham. So I had to commute weekly um, to go down there, which was, you know, wasn't the best part about it, but the experience there taught me so much. Um, here you see just some different projects I worked on um, and I just really grew to appreciate this community a lot. And what, what Art Survive focuses on is using art to help revitalize Selma, um, specifically for like economic um, growth. So, you know, you see some different events. The first one on the left is an annual event called Tell Telling, where we have storytellers come and work with the kids in the school and tell them stories, just make them laugh and, um, and spread some positivity. The bottom picture right here is an annual jazz and um, photography exhibition that Art Survive does. This picture is us installing some um, window cleans print window clean prints from a program that we had did. This is me attempting to sew and not cut my finger off. And then the bottom right is a picture of um, me. I had brought Moses in for this project because we were wheat pasting and he knew how to wheat paste. Um, and we had wheat pasted some photographs up on an old building. And the icing on the cake for this, this period of time I worked there was doing this project. This was like my, almost like my final exam, not really, but it was the first project that I led um, with, without the, the training wheels as much because it was an intern position. And it was the Maxi Mural Project. We went in the schools and um, well, we had an old building, as you can see right here, it was an old auto mechanic shop. And we worked with the students over the course of six months to design a mural and come up with the mural design that represents how they see Selma and how they see their community. So we worked with them and then we actually had them come on site and I had brought some other artists in to come help and um, paint the mural. And it was just a lot of fun. There's nothing that beats seeing the joy on some of these kids' faces, especially um, you know, considering some of the backgrounds that a lot of these kids come from and they don't have as much hope and art can kind of open that door. So another quote, the hardest part is showing up. The next hardest part is the patience required to become proficient. And, you know, that's something that I always tell myself because I'm always really secretly super nervous. Like even doing this, doing this talk, this is kind of different for me. So, I mean, I'm you know, the, if I, the nerves that get to you, if you lit it, but if you just show up, you're already there, you know, it's, it's too late. You can't, no going back. So then it's just patience at that point to become proficient in whatever you do. So then uh, this was a big step for me because I was still working at Art Survive in Selma and I had applied for a, a programming director job with Coleman Center for the Arts which is in York, Alabama. And this meant that I could quit the restaurant job because now I had two part-time jobs that where I was making enough money to where I can pay my bills um, through the arts. So Coleman Center for the Arts, again, is in York, <clears throat> Alabama. And if you're, if you're familiar with York, Alabama, York, Alabama is one of the poorest um, cities in Alabama. So it, it, there was a, a lot to learn in working with them because they didn't have, there wasn't the infrastructure in the city like there was in Selma. So, you know, a lot of these people in the black belt don't even have, you know, certain resources that we take for granted. I mean, there's, there's not a grocery store in, in uh, York, um, just simple things like that. And so Coleman Center for the Arts is using contemporary art too. Um, contemporary art, to help to 
bring life to York. And, um, you know, so it was, I, I had to learn a lot. And Jackie Clay, who runs Coleman Center for the Arts, is an exceptional human being and taught me so much. She is extremely knowledgeable. Um, so here's some, some of the, the various little, various programs that we've done. Um, this pit, this cute little girl right here is, this was from an exhibition that we had hosted. And um, right here is a community garden. So there's a community garden um, as well. On the right is a program that we did with, we, we did an internship with local students and then they created artwork and we showcased the artwork and had them do artist talks. And then the bottom is another exhibition as well with uh, local artist, Tony Dingham. Um, and as that was all going on, I had made Vibes and Virtues into a brand at that point in time because I knew, all right, I like fashion. I like doing the clothing stuff. I like art. I do these events, but everything was just all over the place. And I was like, you know what? I have to make, you know, if I'm trying to sell myself to people, it's impossible to tell them I do all these different things. So Vibes and Virtues, um, I, I, I made it into a brand. So here you're seeing a screenshot from the website where with just different images of uh, clothing designs. And uh, so during that, about a year ago, then I, I started working with the museum and a lot of that really just had to do with um, the work I was already doing in the community. And, you know, they, I had met with the museum and we had some talks about it. And um, at first I, I was apprehensive about it because I, I really did enjoy the work I was doing with small nonprofits. Um, but then again, going into that stepping out of your comfort zone thing, I had realized, hey, this is something I need to learn. This is, this is, um, this is a bigger institution and I need to understand how this works. So that's where I'm at right now. And I'm the manager of public programs at the Birmingham Museum of Art. Um, so, and moving forward. So this right here, these are pictures. This was very important for me because if you can remember, I was saying that I had realized I was, I was making my music separate from my art. And it was hurting me in a lot of different ways because I didn't, for so long, I had been trying to figure out how to make it cohesive. And I didn't know how to do that. So this is a, I, I worked with Vinegar Contemporary, which is um, a, a local nonprofit contemporary arts organization, um, which Anne actually runs and um, Anna Melissa. And I did this exhibition and they really challenged me a lot to really just be comfortable with letting go and um, they embrace these ideas. So what it consisted of was a projection piece that I made, um, which is about a 20, 30 minute, 20 to 30 minute film that coincided with a music release that was interspersed throughout the film. There was one painting in the show, which you see right here. Then there was also a script that everyone who entered the show, they got this story um, script that coincided each each page of the story coincided with a song from the project and then I also did a performance as well so that meant a lot to me because it showed me that it was possible to do a whole bunch at once and make it cohesive and then that goes to where I'm at right now which is the black cherry tree project so I had applied for a grant. Um, it was actually, it was my, my first grant, which was NPN, National Performance Network, Southern Artists for Social Change. And it was a racial, had to be a racial reconciliation project. So the Black Cherry Tree Project is, and um, it commemorates the 33 lynching victims of Jefferson County by allowing local, so local artists apply to make a DAW representative of one of these 33 victims using Jefferson County Memorial Projects research. And um, those dolls are going to be made and then planted alongside a black cherry tree sapling 
at a local business um, for each one and commemorate that victim and extend the life of that victim forever. And the website is right here. I, I see we're running short on time, but I do want to say um, we just opened up applications for it. So if you are interested in applying, please uh, visit this website to learn more about it. It's a simple form you fill out. And um, this is, we're trying to just make this a huge, big community project. So uh, in closing out, these are just some other uh, things I wrote down, but I didn't know where to put them in the slide. And I'll just read them. But art has the ability to inspire change instead of forcing it. It is the most intrusive yet subtle catalyst. Success comes in the form of affirmations played out in the physical world, but what I've noticed is that the artist is usually years ahead. Success is whatever parameters you set in your mind. Never be defensive. Just because you embrace critique doesn't mean you have to implement it. Embrace it and consider it always to shape your perspective. Never let anyone tell you that you have to focus on one form. Every medium is only a tool to channel your spirit. Figure out what you want to do and find someone doing it and learn from them. Do right to all people because it will always come back. It's only a matter of when. An artist just gets it done. When the work is complete, it isn't yours anymore. The world decides its value. Make more while they decide. And yeah, I think that's all I got. Um, and you can connect with me. This is, if, if we're not able to get to your question today, send me a DM. This is my Instagram. I would love to connect with you. Um, and then this is my website, vibesandvirtues.com. Um, and yeah, first seven people that use code Montevallo get 25% off the entire store. So that is all I got. And uh, thank you all. Thank you, Carrie. That I just really uh, wanted to say that I really appreciate your vulnerability in sharing all of this stuff with us. And I think it's it's really valuable for people to hear, you know, that your path always isn't a straight line from point A to point B, but you know, it's um, the parts, the little like loopy parts along the way where you're finding your way sometimes end up being the most important parts of all. Um, and I, I just appreciate your willingness to, to kind of talk about all that stuff and like mistakes that you made and everything. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Again, I was I was secretly nervous before going into this. But, uh, I showed up. So you did. Step one. Check. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions, I'm here to um, answer them. I have a question. Yeah. OK, so as somebody, what is your um, advice to somebody who's starting a business or just doing something within the arts and you're feeling discouraged because you know it's moving slow like what is your advice about that um I would say that you know part of the discouragement is necessary in the beginning um and to just continue to I mean figure out your figure out your goals but don't tie your goals to uh things that you can't control. Tie, tie your goals to things that you can control. And as long as you, just remember, as long as you keep making work and you keep good connections and treating people great, then you can only progress because it's only a matter of time. Some people get their, get their uh, breakthrough when they're 35. Some people get it at 25, it's not a race. Um, and the more you learn, the more you learn, the better the the better it's going to make you. The more versatile it's going to make you. So, um, you know, some of the discouragement is just just take that as a sign that you um, should should address that and 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 move forward. Whatever is making you discouraged, just continue to explore that. Hope that helped. <laughs> It did. <laughs> Carrie, I think there's a question in the chat from Sonia. Just 
Yeah. Okay. Um, I've had to work two jobs before while being a full-time student, and it is very difficult. I know how tiring it can be. How did you manage to stay positive and focus on your goals without letting yourself lose hope? Um, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't all peach and dandy. There was definitely moments of losing hope. Um, but I think that what I what I did is I wasn't focused on the I, I was focused on the joy. I was focused on in 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 enriching my curiosity. So I would pick up projects and I would do things simply because I wanted to just learn more about it or I wanted to be in that group of people where I thought that I could learn from certain situations and I just explored those. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, it is, it is hard working multiple jobs and um, keeping the bills paid at the same time while pursuing your art. But, um, you know, just realize that as long as you keep going and you just don't stop making work, as long as you keep making work, you will be successful. And um, it's only just a matter of time. Because it just takes that one opportunity, it takes that one chance, it takes that one connection to literally change your, your circumstance. So um, how did I find out about the grant? I heard about the grant uh, it was, I, I was emailed from um, a colleague was, it, it was like an email blast. And um, I had seen the grant. I never had applied for a grant before. And I just, uh, I thought that it, it would be time to. And, and it was actually a, the idea for Black Cherry Tree Project was conversations I was having with a buddy of mine. I mean, he's an artist and we always come up with these really unique ideas. And um it just seemed like the timing was right because we had heard about this grant and we had just discussed this idea. So uh, yeah, we just took it upon ourselves to do it. Um, where did I perform my music in the beginning? In the beginning, I performed my music at uh, anybody who would let me really. Um, again, I just wanted to share, I, I just, I just really wanted to share my music. Um, so I would just be really happy if anybody would just say, hey, do you wanna perform? And I wasn't getting paid off of any of those performances. So, and a lot of times I wouldn't get asked. And that was even why I created some of the events and platforms I did because I was like, all right, well, no one wants me to perform at their show or their venue. So I'm gonna make my own show so I can perform. Um, so, yeah. Hey, um, so with like the vibes and virtues uh, website, as you mentioned, like uh, you kind of mentioned, uh, especially towards the end, how it kind of changed to like sort of like a clothing merchandise kind of store. Mm -hmm. So like, what was your initial idea for it and how did it like change over time? Yeah, that's a good question. So it was, you know, we still do the events, the interactive art events are the main piece of Vibes and Virtues. The clothing kind of came from, you know, I was doing, my, my outlet to do clothing was Live, Grind, Love, LGL, the clothing line that I showed earlier. And um, a lot of my ideas would be, I felt like LGL was more of a uh, we had a very specific vision for that. Like it was all about, it, you know, live free, grind hard, love life. It wasn't really as radical. Like I had certain ideas that I felt like were a little bit more radical and a little bit more, um, it, it was more just like selfish art ideas. It was in LGLs taking into consideration, trying to make clothing that inspired people certain kind of ways. And, and so I, I started, I just had all these different ideas that I wanted to do, but it, they kind of didn't fit with what me and my uh, business partner had thought with LGL. So I, I started doing Vibes and Virtues um, clothing through, through that as well, just as a, a release for that. Um, so yeah, hope that answers your question. Yeah.
Anybody else? Any final questions before we sign off today? I like to just embrace the awkwardness of Zoom. Let there be a little quiet. <laughs> yes, let's make it awkward. I guess pointing it out makes it even more. Yeah, I mean, the main thing that I would say, y'all, is, uh, well, for one, just be thankful, you know, just be thankful that you, for one, are alive and that you're where you at where you're at right now and there's a lot of people who don't have what you have um and then there uh, there's of course there's people who do but when you operate from a space of gratitude then i think you see more solutions um did you ever feel unsure about where your life was going <laughs> you know i of course there are definitely down times um and I mean, for me, I, I mean, I'm a spiritual person. I do believe in God. Um, so that would kind of get me through those, those times. But yes, I definitely felt unsure about where my life was going um, a few different times, especially when you make mistakes, um, big mistakes, and, and you don't know how it's going to work out. But, you know, I think, I think the key is just taking it day by day. Um, and keeping that faith, keeping faith in, in something bigger than yourself, because, uh, you know, life is so uncertain. So you never will have the answers, but as long as you keep faith and faith in yourself and what can happen, then that's how miracles happen. Miracles don't happen from logic. You can't be logical trying to explain miracles. Um, so open yourself up to, to receive miracles and be in a place where miracles can happen. And you just have to believe in how you feel and your emotions and, and trust that because, you know, that's, if you don't feel right, then you're not going to do right. So, you know, follow what makes you feel right and feel complete. So. That is excellent advice, and I feel like that's a good place to stop, too. <laughs> um, if you all will indulge me, everybody just unmute for a minute. <laughs> Welcome all your noise, and uh, let, let's um, thank Carrie, the Montevallo way. Let's all give him a nice virtual. <laughs> 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 for coming and sharing with us today and I am I'm just really excited to see where your career goes from here thank you thank you so much Misty and thank you all for spending some time with me um you know I have love for each and every one of y'all I just I can feel the energy in this conversation and um again I'm I'm only a, a email phone call um dm away so you know, if I can help offer any kind of insight, input, it's whatever you're doing, I would love to. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.